Welcome to Under the Rug at Work, where I shine light on problems that are normally swept under the rug. Today, I'm chatting with Evelyn Field about why bullying isn't taken seriously at work. Evelyn is a psychologist, author, speaker, and chair of the Australian Association for Workplace Bullying Professionals. She was also awarded an Order of Australia medal for her initiatives for school and workplace bullying. Thank you so much for joining me, Evelyn. Thank you, Nicole. Now, we know that bullying causes harm, not only to the person that's experiencing it, but to the whole workplace culture. In my personal experience, it made me physically sick for quite a while. I absolutely dreaded going to work. I couldn't sleep and I did everything that I could to avoid the person. In your view and experience, why is bullying bad? Well, I think it's a really good question, Nicole, because I know a lot of money is spent on bullying programs that unfortunately are not getting anywhere yet in schools or in workplaces. And I think it's about going back to the drawing board and saying, well, why is bullying bad? Mm -hmm. So to me, bullying represents someone pointing the bone at, let's say, at me or you and saying, you're no good, get out of here. In other words, you don't belong, you don't qualify as a member of our tribe. Now, we all need tribes to belong to. Animals are exactly the same. I know there are a few animals that live a more uh, singular existence, but most animals hang around as a bunch. And we need to, for one reason or another, hang around as a bunch, whether it's at school, at work, football, church, family, dance group, gym. We like to be with other people. And, of course, COVID showed how much we were lacking even seeing faces at the supermarket. We need to be accepted. So when someone points the finger and says, you're no good, get out of here, it really challenges something very deep inside of us. Now, I have a feeling it goes back to our earlier childhood and how we were raised, and that's for another time or another part of this conversation, but we feel extra vulnerable because they don't pick on the dickheads and the idiots. They pick on people who are hardworking, conscientious, who give it their all and so you give it your all you work longer harder than anyone else and someone says you're not doing your job you're no good get out of here mm -hmm. it's like my gosh it's it feels like a real betrayal by your employer it's not like saying oh there's a tiger in the distance and if you're lucky to see a tiger it'll be the zoo or in a distance in india or somewhere it's living with the tiger because all the time you go through what did I do wrong? What did they say? What did they say? Why didn't he do that? Why didn't she say that? Did I do it? Did I do the wrong thing? So what happens is there's incredible buildup of all those stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol, and they flood the brain. And so what happens is you have burnout, breakdown, and different parts of the brain are actually injured. So we know the symptoms that will come from mild, moderate or severe bullying. We've got a fair idea of what to expect. And not all traumas are the same. So this is a different sort of trauma. So at the end of the day, bullying changes your brain. We know very clearly with children, there are epigenetic changes and people will never recover from that damage. They may learn to live with it, but the damage is, is always there because bullying is a trauma. Bullying is a threat to your life. Mm -hmm. And you go into survival mode, which is very different to enjoying lying on the beach in Bali mode. There's a new group, just in fact, they started meeting this morning at 2.30 my time, so I didn't attend, around the world, talking about the neurobiology of bullying. And my colleague, Pat Ferris, presented about this in Santiago at the International Association of Workplace Bullying and Harassment. Mm -hmm. But what we've got is a slow movement. So you have people saying, well, bullying causes PTSD. When you've got PTSD, you've got a brain change. And then we started looking at kids and saying, well, kids who are bullied at school can also have that. Now we're seeing that adults who are bullied at work can also have a very severe uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. We're starting to see some scans. I don't know how legitimate they all are, but certainly there's a difference between a normal brain and a PTSD. D brain or a depressed brain in a normal brain and I'm looking forward to the time where when you've been bullied one can compare your brain scans to a normal person's brain scans mm -hmm. and maybe if you've had early intervention or early treatment to look at 
how you were when you were first bullied and then uh, following hopefully successful treatment. The fact of the matter is, is that I don't know what my heart looks like right now. And in fact, in a few weeks, I'm going to have a checkup. But I wouldn't have a clue unless I went through a number of different medical processes to look inside the heart. And it's the same thing with our brain. You don't know what's going on. But I assure you that many different parts of this incredible, complicated computer is operating in a different way to survive the threats to its life when the people are being bullied. So then you get the brain changes. You get the physical, the psychological, the cognitive, the social, and finally the personality change. Yeah. And then you get the long-term injuries. They're all injuries. You'll get people who are bullied more likely to have chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia or hair loss, mm -hmm. uh, stomach problems. All of them have sleep problems. That goes without saying. A lot of them have concentration pr problems on other things, but they remember everything about their case. So I don't want to go into all of the symptoms, but yeah. there is a clear profile. When you talk about that initial feeling of, oh, I'm feeling sick. I'm, I'm crying in the toilet at, at work. Um, I don't want to go to work today. I'm, I'm shivering and shaking inside, maybe having a panic attack. Um, very, very common. But then, you know, if you've been severely bullied out of your workplace or not able to work for a while, then the symptoms will grow. So, I've heard you say that before, bullying is a brain injury. And um, I was just looking on my desk for a book it's called Why Love Matters. And it talks about the development of the brain from in the womb through to your childhood and toddler years and how, yeah, small changes can make a huge impact because especially when you're a baby, you have to rely on, on certain people. And yeah, what you're saying is making complete sense and also a little scary and a little alarming. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if let's say, um, a parent is suffering from a mental illness or a parent is never around, or a parent died early, uh, or a parent is at work and worried about a lot of other things, um, and the child feels as though they don't get enough attachment, mm -hmm. their brain will develop, in other words, like a bonsai tree. Yeah. So if you get what you need as a growing young baby child, then you will be able to deal with bullying better. If you don't get what you need, now it's not what mum or dad do, it's what you feel you receive and you need. Um, then you grow up more vulnerable, more sensitive. So someone says, oh, you know, this is ridiculous, this sort of work. And it goes back to how you felt as a child. Mm -hmm. and maybe at school, who knows, maybe where else. So that inner vulnerability, sensitivity is built in, is developed, created when the young person is very young, the first few years of life. But it may not surface until you're in your 50s and someone is threatened by your high level of competence. Mm. So instead of being neutral and blocking them, yeah. um, you know, when someone says you're an idiot, you get upset. Instead yeah. of saying, oh, that's so interesting. Would you mind giving me the evidence with a lovely square smile? There's always two ways to react. Many of us react with our uh, survival instinct, our fight or flight reflex, rather than using the prefrontal cortex and saying, hmm, this guy is incompetent. He's an idiot. He's a dickhead. He's only ended up in this job because he can't get another one, even if he is my boss now because he's sucked up to everybody. How do I deal with this guy? Instead of taking it personally, yeah. I can play that game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And fight and flight, it, it shuts down that prefrontal cortex, right? So, yeah, it's our brain does change based on our experiences. A problem a lot of us have with bullying is that we don't take it seriously. Yes. And we say, where's the evidence? Yes. Where's the evidence you were bullied? If I was walking along the corridor at work and someone had had a banana for morning tea and they threw the peel into the bin but missed and I, being a klutz, didn't see it, and I slipped over it. What happens? If I'm 19, I get up and say, oh, idiot, put the peel in bin. If I'm 25, I might have a bruise. If I'm 55, with fragile bones, I could be laid up for a long period of time. Now, if it had to go to court, because I also broke my front teeth, nobody's going to say, do you mind showing us the banana peel mm -hmm. three years later? 
right? Nobody. Yeah. They just look at the scans. But mm -hmm. when it comes to bullying, they say, who saw the bully? What's the proof that you were bullied? Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that the symptoms are very, very clear. You have somebody working competently one day and a few months later, not working at all or not working competently. So the medical injuries are very clear, yes. but they want the banana peel. They want the proof that someone saw them being bullied and mm -hmm. who's going to dob on their manager or their mates anyway, who yeah. sees the impact. So calling me fat might mean nothing to me, but might mean something else to somebody else. So they say, oh, well, it didn't happen. Nobody saw it. Just because someone took the banana peel away doesn't mean you didn't break your femur. Mm -hmm. so there is this very, to me, it's very faulty thinking. They say, unless we've got proof that it was within our definition of bullying, it didn't happen. No, you have to find out whether that person who was injured experienced something that was life-threatening or threatening and has been injured by it, which is quite easy to demonstrate. So that's a problem we have. That means psychiatrists, psychologists, GPs, and many lawyers don't take bullying injury seriously. Because it's, one, the onus is on the victim to prove it occurred. It's hard to prove it occurred in that list. And do you think it's also because they feel that people lie or it's just in the too hard basket? Can't, can't deal with it, so let's put it there and suck it up and move on because I don't want to deal with it. I don't know what I'm doing. I think the whole concept of bullying is a bit of an oxymoron. You know, we'll say bully for you and uh, we, we value bullies in, in politics, in sport, you know, everywhere we value bullies except on the stage now or film. Um, and then we don't like them and nobody's proud to be a bully. You'll never hear someone say, I'm so glad I bullied that kid at school. You know, nobody says that. So it's a bit of an oxymoron. Mm. How can we get employers or workplaces or managers to take bullying seriously? Is there a solution? Well, it's it's very, very difficult. And many people around the world are obviously trying to, you know, juggle this. The simple solution would be say, who gives us stuff about human beings and their lives? Let's just think about performance and productivity. So it's very clear that if there is bullying in an organisation, I would say, and I've got no evidence, but just reading, thinking, whatever, I'd say in about a third of cases, there's fraud or unethical behaviours, right? Yep. Number two, performance goes down. Uh, disengagement goes up. The rates of disengagement in around the world, according to the Gallup poll 2022, is about four-fifths. One-fifth of the workplace are engaged at work, four-fifths aren't. But we know people work very well at home during COVID. So what's happening? It's just the stress at work, bullying, and every, all the other things that happen are worse in the workplace than they are at home. So we know that when people are unhappy, they're not going to perform. They're going to have sick days. They're going to be uh, present but not doing very much. They're going to sabotage. They'll waste their time, do their shopping online, pinch secrets, heaven knows what. So one could look at productivity and performance. One could look at sick days, amounts of money lost through work cover, insurance claims, um, training new staff, advertising for some new staff. I mean, it's amazing the turnover some companies have. And yeah. they don't say, what's going on? Yeah. And it's not just turnovers. The same bully might have had three or four people on work cover. Yeah. Why work cover saying, hey, what's this guy doing? And this is where our colleague Donna Stemmer and the work she's doing will be very, very interesting. So I think the first thing we would be saying is, well, you know, how does the uh, employer, the owner of the organisation suffer when there's bullying? Mm -hmm. Now, many of them are too dumb to realise it, but that's one, the, one way you could actually look at it. Yeah. The other is to say, you know, there's such a thing as a charter of human rights. And all of us have the right to go to school, work, home, and not to be physically or verbally abused, ostracised, humiliated, etc., like that. And that means everyone has a voice and everyone should be respected and everyone should be heard. And that there should be collaborative ways of resol resolving differences of opinion. Yeah. Um, and I think the third way is to say bullying is caused by poor management. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. You know, people who are paid to manage don't know how to do it. They're not trained. They're not made accountable. Yeah, they're not given the right tools either. There are many ways we could tackle bullying 
would be nice to say that we care for other people and look after their welfare and we don't want to see so many people off sick injured but I don't think the world is like that I'd rather see uh, managers being made accountable for how they manage their staff and maybe if they were looking at that big picture as well like whether that's the HR function the corporate function the employer what is actually going on where's the trend where's the pattern is it whenever you move that one bully or person, does everything start to fall apart? You should be asking yourself as an employer or manager, what is the turnover? If like I know of teams who um, have got a new manager and the entire team has jumped ship, that should mm. be a huge red flag to people. It's almost as if they they fail up <laughs> and they get promoted. <laughs> That's right. And having appointed a bully, um, they're too ashamed to say, oh, we were wrong. But they don't protect the bully either because bullies are then thrown out later on. So they don't say, well, you know, Joe is really good with his work. It's just he's rotten with people. Let's give him some coaching and training on how to stop his bullying behaviour so he can keep his job and hold his head up high. To be accused of being a bully is devastating. Yes. And a lot of the time it's miscommunication, misunderstanding or your abrasive behaviour. But sometimes it is because you are a bully. And I find that if you go into any organisation and ask who's the bully here or who sexually harasses others, you will get a pretty clear picture. Um, I've actually been in workplaces too where we've done the staff survey and we were reviewing that in an executive meeting and one of them laughed and said, yeah, that'd be me. And he, yeah, did think it was quite funny self-confessed bully and probably shouldn't be in a position that he's in. <laughs> Mind you, on the other hand, I mean, we know that there can be, you know, sexual harassment, gender harass harassment, racial harassment. But, you know, I think the major concern is that there are more men in power and more men tend to harass women than the other way around. Mm -hmm. But for the last, oh, I don't know, 10,000 years, men have been able to rape, abuse, harass, discriminate against women. You know, the average female salaries, I think, are still about $12,000 or $13,000 less than the average male. And they've been able to get away with everything for years and years and years. And suddenly people are saying, no, this is not good enough. You know, women have rights. Women don't want to be harassed at, at work. I mean, around the world, um, there's probably far more sexual harassment compared to what's happening in Australia, New Zealand, UK, USA, and parts of Europe. Mm -hmm. I would say the rest of the world is as high as it ever was. I feel a bit sorry for these guys who've been able to get away with it for such a long time. And suddenly someone's saying, no, it's not on. So why isn't it taken seriously at work? Well, I think that 20 years ago, we weren't taking schoolboying very seriously. And principals would say, boys will be boys, girls will be girls, no big deal. And of course, the same thing in the workplace. I think in the last decade, we're taking school bullying more seriously. And probably the last few years, we're taking workplace bullying, harassment, discrimination a bit more seriously. But I would like to see my colleagues, the mental health professionals, really taking it seriously. I was speaking to a bunch of psychologists earlier in the year and I said, do you know where you find bullying in the DSM-5? The DSM-5 is the psychiatrist's Bible. And they just looked at me blankly, you know. <laughs> they didn't know where workplace bullying was and they didn't know that school bullying was not mentioned in the DSM-5. I mean, we're talking about issues that harm a young person's life and at the rate of, what, one in five, and they don't even know where it is or isn't mentioned in the DSM-5. You know, I can't blame a manager for not knowing what a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a GP should actually know. Dealing with bullying is an organisational systemic responsibility, but we've got to educate people that bullying changes the brain. It is a brain injury. Yes. And a physical brain injury. Mm -hmm. Because even if I have panic attacks, if I'm obsessive, if I have stomach problems, if I can't concentrate, that comes because my brain is not functioning. It's a physical brain injury. So whether you have a real brick falling on your head or a bullying brick, there's no difference. Yeah, well, 
Thank you so much, Evelyn. I, I really appreciate your insight and your knowledge and your perspective. You have such a unique perspective. If you want to learn more about yourself or your organization, visit your website, bullying.com.au. Thank you again, Evelyn. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Nicole.